Part two, chapter four of Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea An Underwater Tour of the World by Jules Verne. Chapter four The Red Sea during the day of january twenty nine the island of ceylon disappeared below the horizon and at a speed of twenty miles per hour the nautilus glided into the labyrinthine channels that separate the maldive and lacadive islands it likewise hugged kilton island a shore of madreporic origin discovered by vasco da gama in fourteen ninety nine and one of the nineteen chief islands in the island group of the lacadives located between latitude ten degrees and fourteen degrees thirty minutes north and between longitude fifty degrees seventy two minutes and sixty nine degrees east by then we had fared sixteen thousand two hundred and twenty miles or seven thousand five hundred leagues from our starting point in the seas of japan the next day january thirty when the nautilus rose to the surface of the ocean there was no more land in sight setting its course to the north northwest the ship headed toward the gulf of oman carved out between arabia and the indian peninsula and providing access to the persian gulf this was obviously a blind alley with no possible outlet so where was captain nemo taking us i was unable to say which didn't satisfy the canadian who that day asked me where we were going we're going mr ned where the captain's fancy takes us his fancy the canadian replied won't take us very far the persian gulf has no outlet and if we enter those waters it won't be long before we return in our tracks all right we'll return mr land and after the persian gulf if the nautilus wants to visit the red sea the strait of bab el mandeb is still there to let us in i don't have to tell you sir ned land replied that the red sea is just as landlocked as the gulf since the isthmus of suez hasn't been cut all the way through yet and even if it was a boat as secretive as ours wouldn't risk a canal intersected with locks so the red sea won't be our way back to europe either but i didn't say we'd return to europe what do you figure then i figure that after visiting these unusual waterways of arabia and egypt the nautilus will go back down to the indian ocean perhaps through mozambique channel perhaps off the mascarene islands and then make for the cape of good hope and once we're at the cape of good hope the canadian asked with typical persistence well then we'll enter that atlantic ocean with which we aren't yet familiar what's wrong ned my friend are you tired of this voyage under the seas are you bored with the constantly changing sight of these underwater wonders speaking for myself i'll be extremely distressed to see the end of a voyage so few men will ever have a chance to make but don't you realize professor aronnax the canadian replied that soon we'll have been imprisoned for three whole months aboard this nautilus no ned i didn't realize it i don't want to realize it and i don't keep track of every day and every hour but when will it be over in its appointed time meanwhile there's nothing we can do about it and our discussions are futile my gallant ned if you come and tell me a chance to escape is available to us then i'll discuss it with you but that isn't the case and in all honesty i don't think captain nemo ever ventures into european seas this short dialogue reveals that in my mania for the nautilus i was turning into the spitting image of its commander as for ned land he ended our talk in his best speechifying style that's all fine and dandy but in my humble opinion a life in jail is a life without joy for four days until february three the nautilus inspected the gulf of oman at various speeds and depths it seemed to be traveling at random as if hesitating over which course to follow but it never crossed the tropic of cancer after leaving this gulf we raised muscat for an instant the most important town in the country of oman i marveled at its strange appearance in the midst of the black rocks surrounding it against which the white of its houses and forts stood out sharply 
i spotted the rounded domes of its mosques the elegant tips of its minarets and its fresh leafy terraces but it was only a fleeting vision and the nautilus soon sank beneath the dark waves of these waterways then our ship went along at a distance of six miles from the arabic coasts of mara and hadramaut their undulating lines of mountains relieved by a few ancient ruins on february five we finally put into the gulf of aden a genuine funnel stuck into the neck of bab el mandeb and bottling these indian waters in the red sea on February 6, the Nautilus cruised in sight of the city of Aden, perched on a promontory connected to the continent by a narrow isthmus, a sort of inaccessible Gibraltar whose fortifications the English rebuilt after capturing it in 1839. I glimpsed the octagonal minarets of this town, which used to be one of the wealthiest, busiest commercial centers along this coast, as the Arab historian Idrisi tells it. I was convinced that when Captain Nemo reached this point, he would back out again, but I was mistaken, and much to my surprise, he did nothing of the sort. The next day, February 7, we entered the Strait of Bab el Mandeb, whose name means Gate of Tears in the Arabic language. Twenty miles wide, it's only 52 kilometers long, and with the Nautilus launched at full speed, clearing it was the work of barely an hour. But I didn't see a thing, not even Piram Island, where the British government built fortifications to strengthen Aden's position. There were many English and French steamers plowing this narrow passageway, liners going from Suez to Bombay, Calcutta, Melbourne, Reunion Island, and Mauritius. Far too much traffic for the Nautilus to make an appearance on the surface, so it wisely stayed in midwater. Finally, at noon, we were plowing the waves of the Red Sea. The Red Sea, that great lake so famous in biblical traditions, seldom replenished by rains, fed by no important rivers, continually drained by a high rate of evaporation, its water level dropping a meter and a half every year. If it were fully landlocked, like a lake, this odd gulf might dry up completely. On this score, it's inferior to its neighbors, the Caspian Sea and the Dead Sea, whose levels lower only to the point where their evaporation exactly equals the amounts of water they take to their hearts. This Red Sea is 2,600 kilometers long, with an average width of 240. In the days of the Ptolemies and the Roman emperors, it was a great commercial artery for the world, and when its isthmus has been cut through, it will completely regain that bygone importance that the Suez railways have already brought back in part. I would not even attempt to understand the whim that induced Captain Demo to take us into this gulf, but I wholeheartedly approved of the Nautilus's entering it. It adopted a medium pace, sometimes staying on the surface, sometimes diving to avoid some ship, and so I could observe both the inside and top side of this highly unusual sea. On February 8, as early as the first hours of daylight, Mocha appeared before us, a town now in ruins, whose walls would collapse at the mere sound of a cannon, and which shelters a few leafy date trees here and there. This once important city used to contain six public marketplaces plus 26 mosques, and its walls, protected by 14 forts, fashioned a three-kilometer girdle around it. Then the Nautilus drew near the beaches of Africa, where the sea is considerably deeper. There, through the open panels and in a mid-water of crystal clarity, our ship enabled us to study wonderful bushes of shining coral and huge chunks of rock wrapped in splendid green furs of algae and fucus. What an indescribable sight, and what a variety of settings and scenery where these reefs and volcanic islands leveled off by the Libyan coast. But soon the Nautilus hugged the eastern shore where these tree forms appeared in all their glory. This was off the coast of Tehama, and there such zoophyte displays not only flourished below sea level, but they also fashioned picturesque networks that unreeled as high as ten fathoms above it. The latter were more whimsical but less colorful than the former, which kept their bloom thanks to the moist vitality of the waters. 
how many delightful hours i spent in this way at the lounge window how many new specimens of underwater flora and fauna i marveled at beneath the light of our electric beacon mushroom-shaped fungus coral some slate-colored sea anemone including the species thalassianthus aster among others organ pipe coral arranged like flutes and just begging for a puff from the god pan shells unique to this sea that dwell in madreporic cavities and whose bases are twisted into squat spirals and finally a thousand samples of a polypary i hadn't observed until then the common sponge first division in the polyp group the class spongiaria has been created by scientists precisely for this unusual exhibit whose usefulness is beyond dispute the sponge is definitely not a plant as some naturalists still believe but an animal of the lowest order a polypary inferior even to coral its animal nature isn't in doubt and we can't accept even the views of the ancients who regarded it as halfway between plant and animal but i must say that naturalists are not in agreement on the structural mode of sponges for some it's a polypary and for others such as professor milne edwards it's a single solitary individual the class spongiaria contains about three hundred species that are encountered in a large number of seas and even in certain streams where they've been given the name freshwater sponges but their waters of choice are the red sea and the mediterranean near the greek islands or the coast of syria these waters witness the reproduction and growth of soft delicate bath sponges whose prices run as high as one hundred and fifty francs a piece the yellow sponge from syria the horn sponge from barbary etc but since i had no hope of studying these zoophytes in the seaports of the levant from which we were separated by the insuperable isthmus of suez i had to be content with observing them in the waters of the red sea so i called conseil to my side while at an average depth of eight to nine meters the nautilus slowly skimmed every beautiful rock on the easterly coast there sponges grew in every shape globular stalk-like leaf-like finger-like with reasonable accuracy they lived up to their nicknames of basket sponges chalice sponges distaff sponges elkhorn sponges lion's paws peacock's tails and neptune's gloves designations bestowed on them by fishermen more poetically inclined than scientists a gelatinous semi-fluid substance coated the fibrous tissue of these sponges and from this tissue there escaped a steady trickle of water that after carrying sustenance to each cell was being expelled by a contracting movement this jelly-like substance disappears when the polyp dies emitting ammonia as it rots finally nothing remains but the fibers either gelatinous or made of horn that constitute your household sponge which takes on a russet hue and is used for various tasks depending on its degree of elasticity permeability or resistance to saturation these polyparies were sticking to rocks shells of mollusks and even the stalks of water plants they adorned the smallest crevices some sprawling others standing or hanging like coral outgrowths i told conseil that sponges are fished up in two ways either by dragnet or by hand the latter method calls for the services of a diver but it's preferable because it spares the polypary's tissue leaving it with a much higher market value other zoophytes swarming near the sponges consisted chiefly of very elegant species of jellyfish mollusks were represented by varieties of squid that according to professor orbigny are unique to the red sea and reptiles by vergata turtles belonging to the genus chelonia which furnished our table with a dainty but wholesome dish as for fish they were numerous and often remarkable here are the ones that the nautilus's nets most frequently hauled on board rays including spotted rays that were oval in shape and brick red in color their bodies strewn with erratic blue speckles and identifiable by their jagged double stings silver-backed skates common sting rays with stippled tails butterfly rays that looked like huge two-meter cloaks flapping at mid-depth toothless guitar fish that were a type of cartilaginous fish closer to the shark 
trunk fish known as dromedaries that were one and a half feet long and had humps ending in backward curving stings serpentine moray eels with silver tails and bluish backs plus brown pectorals trimmed in gray piping a species of butterfish called the fiatola decked out in thin gold stripes and the three colors of the french flag montague blennies four decimeters long superb jacks handsomely embellished by seven black crosswise streaks with blue and yellow fins plus gold and silver scales snooks standard mullet with yellow heads parrotfish wrasse triggerfish gobies etc plus a thousand other fish common to the oceans we had already crossed on february nine the nautilus cruised in the widest part of the red sea measuring one hundred and ninety miles straight across from swaken on the west coast to cunifitta on the east coast at noon that day after our position fix captain nemo climbed onto the platform where i happened to be i vowed not to let him go below again without at least sounding him out on his future plans as soon as he saw me he came over graciously offered me a cigar and said to me well professor are you pleased with this red sea have you seen enough of its hidden wonders its fish and zoophytes its gardens of sponges and forests of coral have you glimpsed the towns built on its shores yes captain nemo i replied and the nautilus is wonderfully suited to this whole survey ah it's a clever boat yes sir clever daring and invulnerable it fears neither the red sea's dreadful storms nor its currents and reefs indeed i said this sea is mentioned as one of the worst and in the days of the ancients if i'm not mistaken it had an abominable reputation thoroughly abominable professor aranax the greek and latin historians can find nothing to say in its favor and the greek geographer strabo adds that it's especially rough during the rainy season and the period of summer prevailing winds the arab idrisi referring to it by the name gulf of Khazoum, relates that ships perished in large numbers on its sandbanks and that no one risked navigating it by night this he claims is a sea subject to fearful hurricanes strewn with inhospitable islands and with nothing good to offer either on its surface or in its depths as a matter of fact the same views can also be found in arian agathochides and artemidorus one can easily see i answered that those historians didn't navigate aboard the nautilus indeed the captain replied with a smile and in this respect the moderns aren't much farther along than the ancients it took many centuries to discover the mechanical power of steam who knows whether we'll see a second nautilus within the next hundred years progress is slow professor aranax it's true i replied your ship is a century ahead of its time perhaps several centuries it would be most unfortunate if such a secret were to die with its inventor captain nemo did not reply after some minutes of silence we were discussing he said the views of ancient historians on the dangers of navigating this red sea true i replied but weren't their fears exaggerated yes and no professor aranax answered captain nemo who seemed to know his red sea by heart to a modern ship well rigged solidly constructed and in control of its course thanks to obedient steam some conditions are no longer hazardous that offered all sorts of dangers to the vessels of the ancients picture those early navigators venturing forth in sailboats built from planks lashed together with palm tree ropes caulked with powdered resin and coated with dogfish grease they didn't even have instruments for taking their bearings they went by guesswork in the midst of currents they barely knew under such conditions shipwrecks had to be numerous but nowadays steamers providing service between suez and the south seas have nothing to fear from the fury of this gulf despite the contrary winds of its monsoons 
their captains and passengers no longer prepare for departure with sacrifices to placate the gods and after returning they don't traipse in wreaths and gold ribbons to say thanks at the local temple agreed i said and steam seems to have killed off all gratitude in seamen's hearts but since you seem to have made a special study of this sea captain can you tell me how it got its name many explanations exist on the subject professor aranax would you like to hear the views of one chronicler in the fourteenth century gladly this fanciful fellow claims the sea was given its name after the crossing of the israelites when the pharaoh perished in those waves that came together again at moses's command to mark that miraculous sequel the sea turned a red without equal thus no other course would do but to name it for its hue an artistic explanation captain nemo i replied but i'm unable to rest content with that so i'll ask you for your own personal views here they come to my thinking professor aronnax this red sea designation must be regarded as a translation of the hebrew word edrum and if the ancients gave it that name it was because of the unique color of its waters until now however i've seen only clear waves without any unique hue surely but as we move ahead to the far end of this gulf you'll note its odd appearance i recall seeing the bay of el tour completely red like a lake of blood and you attribute this color to the presence of microscopic algae yes it's a purplish mucilaginous substance produced by those tiny buds known by the name trichodesmia forty thousand of which are needed to occupy the space of one square millimeter perhaps you'll encounter them when we reach el tour hence captain nemo this isn't the first time you've gone through the red sea aboard the nautilus no sir then since you've already mentioned the crossing of the israelites and the catastrophe that befell the egyptians i would ask if you've ever discovered any traces under the waters of that great historic event no professor and for an excellent reason what's that it's because the same locality where moses crossed with all his people is now so clogged with sand camels can barely get their legs wet you can understand that my nautilus wouldn't have enough water for itself and that locality is i asked that locality lies a little above suez in a sound that used to form a deep estuary when the red sea stretched as far as the bitter lakes now whether or not their crossing was literally miraculous the israelites did cross there in returning to the promised land and the pharaoh's army did perish at precisely that locality so i think that excavating those sands would bring to light a great many weapons and tools of egyptian origin obviously i replied and for the sake of archaeology let's hope that sooner or later such excavations do take place once new towns are settled on the isthmus after the suez canal has been cut through a canal by the way of little use to a ship such as the nautilus surely but of great use to the world at large captain nemo said the ancients well understood the usefulness to commerce of connecting the red sea with the mediterranean but they never dreamed of cutting a canal between the two and instead they picked the nile as their link if we can trust tradition it was probably egypt's king sesostris who started digging the canal needed to join the nile with the red sea what's certain is that in 615 bc king necho ii was hard at work on a canal that was fed by nile water and ran through the egyptian plains opposite arabia this canal could be traveled in four days and it was so wide two triple-tiered galleys could pass through it abreast its construction was continued by darius the great son of hystaspes and probably completed by king ptolemy the second strabo saw it used for shipping but the weakness of its slope between its starting point near bubastus and the red sea left it navigable only a few months out of the year this canal served commerce until the century of rome's antonine emperors it was then abandoned and covered with sand 
subsequently reinstated by arabia's caliph omar i and finally filled in for good in 761 or 762 a.d by caliph al-mansur in an effort to prevent supplies from reaching mohammed ibn abdullah who had rebelled against him during his egyptian campaign your general napoleon bonaparte discovered traces of this old canal in the suez desert and when the tide caught him by surprise he well nigh perished just a few hours before rejoining his regiment at hadjaroth the very place where moses had pitched camped thirty three hundred years before him well captain what the ancients hesitated to undertake mr deliceps is now finishing up his joining of these two seas will shorten the route from cadiz to the east indies by nine thousand kilometers and he'll soon change africa into an immense island yes professor aronnax and you have every right to be proud of your fellow countrymen such a man brings a nation more honor than the greatest commanders like so many others he began with difficulties and setbacks but he triumphed because he has the volunteer spirit and it's sad to think that this deed which should have been an international deed which would have ensured that any administration went down in history will succeed only through the efforts of one man so all hail to mr deliceps yes all hail to that great french citizen i replied quite startled by how emphatically captain nemo had just spoken unfortunately he went on i can't take you through that suez canal but the day after tomorrow you'll be able to see the long jetties of port said when we're in the mediterranean in the mediterranean i exclaimed yes professor does that amaze you what amazes me is thinking we'll be there the day after tomorrow oh really yes captain although since i've been aboard your vessel i should have formed the habit of not being amazed by anything but what is it that startles you the thought of how hideously fast the nautilus will need to go if it's to double the cape of good hope circle around africa and lie in the open mediterranean by the day after tomorrow and who says it will circle africa professor what's this talk about doubling the cape of good hope but unless the nautilus navigates on dry land and crosses over the isthmus or under it professor aronnax under it surely captain nemo replied serenely under that tongue of land nature long ago made what man today is making on its surface what there's a passageway yes an underground passageway that i've named the arabian tunnel it starts below suez and leads to the bay of pelusium but isn't that isthmus only composed of quicksand to a certain depth but at merely fifty meters one encounters a firm foundation of rock and it's by luck that you discovered this passageway i asked more and more startled luck plus logic professor and logic even more than luck captain i hear you but i can't believe my ears oh sir the old saying still holds good aris abon et non audion editor's note latin they have ears but hear not not only does this passageway exist but i've taken advantage of it on several occasions without it i wouldn't have ventured today into such a blind alley as the red sea is it indiscreet to ask how you discovered this tunnel sir the captain answered me there can be no secrets between men who will never leave each other i ignored this innuendo and waited for captain nemo's explanation professor he told me the simple logic of the naturalist led me to discover this passageway and i alone am familiar with it i'd noted that in the red sea and the mediterranean there exist a number of absolutely identical species of fish eels butterfish greenfish bass jewelfish flying fish certain of this fact i wondered if there weren't a connection between the two seas 
if there were, its underground current had to go from the Red Sea to the Mediterranean simply because of their difference in level. So I caught a large number of fish in the vicinity of Suez. I slipped copper rings around their tails and tossed them back into the sea. A few months later, off the coast of Syria, I recaptured a few specimens of my fish, adorned with their telltale rings. So this proved to me that some connection existed between the two seas. I searched for it with my Nautilus. I discovered it. I ventured into it. And soon, Professor, you also will have cleared my Arabic tunnel. End of Part 2, Chapter 4